This is genius. This is Joe Rogan, and you're listening to the Gritty Bowman. I've never seen so many mullets in my life. You know, it's just about feeling good. You, you had more chins than a Chinese phone book for <laughs> a while. Did, yeah, it, it was, was bad. bad. Yeah. I mean, he's right. He said, Goonies never say die. <laughs> We're going. We got this. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I was pulling the trigger, but the safety was on. <laughs> I just Randy Black Not Eagle. Randy that's Black it. Eagle. That's that's my. That's how we roll. Just drop <laughs> the mic and walk away. I am ready. Aaron Snyder, wired for greatness. Tell me when you're ready. All right. Well, we backpacked about 14 miles in last night. Actually, it's more like two and a half. But. Uh, Brian's behind the camera, and then he's got his daughter, Caitlin, here, and then I brought my girlfriend, Amy, but we've had a lot of questions about the gear we use. Um, I'm going to go over kind of what I bring as a standard, uh, what Brian generally brings. His and I, we're, our gear is pretty close to the same, and then some of the stuff I could probably kick out, uh, but clothing's been a big one. I'll go over that first. Um, these are Sitka Timberline pants. Uh, this trip, this is about the the last time I'll probably wear these before these will be too hot. Uh, Brian wore the Ascent pants in. Um, I probably would have worn the Ascent pants uh, in, but I only have one pair right now, and I wear them to work, and I don't want to get them dirty. Uh, and then I have a Black Rifle Coffee poly cotton shirt that I probably won't ever wear hunting. Um, <laughs> this is the Core Crew medium weight top from Sitka. Um, and I, I generally get this in a large, and then I bring the Core Crew heavyweight hoodie and I wear that in an XL over the top so and that that's pretty much my standard and that'll be for the season too uh, I have a Kelvin jacket right here now what may get traded out for this is the Kelvin active for hunting season the only reason I didn't bring the Kelvin active is uh again I only have one of them and I like that jacket so much I don't want to wear it down before hunting season now my girlfriend, she brought the Kelvin down hoodie, and that's in this stuff sack, and hers is in a pile over there. And then right here, this is just a storm front jacket. I didn't bring pants. It's not supposed to rain that much while we're back here. It did rain quite a bit last night. So that's pretty close to what I'm going to wear for the season. Uh, a few twists and turns aside, that'll be kind of my standard layering system. This is an outdoorsman medium tripod. I didn't bring any optics with me. This was just for photography and their standard pan head. <sighs> Move up forward here. I have, um, I get pretty cold in my hands pretty easy. So these, I believe, are the Jetstream glove. And they, I think that's what they are. They could be the cold front. And I probably should know that. But either way, these are a little bit insulated. And then I, that's for when it's cold. These here I wear actually just for labor. Like if I'm breaking wood, I've got a couple sets of them. And I can't, I can't remember. I, I That's as horrible as that is. I can't remember the name of these things, but they're one of my favorite gloves. When I'm wear, using walking sticks, going in, breaking wood, anything, you know, like when it's sharp rocks, climbing or whatever, I use these. This is my newer set here. The other set I've actually cut the finger and the thumb off. Um. So actually, I could take a dip with them on, which is bad. It's unhealthy. Uh, this uh, beanie hat, this is probably my favorite beanie hat ever. Um, this is a Jetstream beanie. And uh, Amy, my girlfriend, she's got the same one in black. But I wear this to bed as well as just around camp when it's cold. Yeah, it's it's nice. It's super. And it, it blocks the wind really well. And then I just have the Flex Fit hat, which I wear all the time. This um, is a moose shed that my girlfriend found this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? She, I was still sleeping. I woke up and I went back to bed and she had a big smile on her face, poked her head inside the tent. And uh, I kind of woke up and I was like, holy cow, you found that. But uh, uh, fishing gear, this is a Dowa four-piece pack rod, basically. It's nothing crazy. It's uh, six foot tall. Um, I've, I've had it for years. I, I, I think it's like 59 bucks or something. They're not super expensive. This is a Sedona reel. Um, and I, it's a Shimano, but, uh, I think it's a Shimano. Yeah. It's just an ultra lightweight. I got four pound test on there. I don't put a whole lot of effort into fishing, to be honest. I carry a ton of these little spinners like Panther Martins, Blue Foxes. Um, you know, the fish I'm catching in here are like six inches. They're not real big. They're just brookies. This is kind of like a brookie setup. I have reeled in some monster fish in the high lakes with this, but the rod about bends in half. 
And then this is actually, this is just a extra small Kafaru pullout. And I've got a little fly box here. Uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce the name there because uh, A-K-I-O-K-U-N. Uh, it's like my favorite case. I probably had it for 15 years. And inside here, it's pretty cut and dry. I got some Pistol Peets, some spinners. That's a Panther Martin. I'm not sure. That's a cast master maybe and then i've got bead-headed brassies irresistibles bead-headed princes i got some san juan worms in there um renegades a bunch of different flies and i've got uh just a, a pile of different stuff um nothing real 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 obviously for real real big fish that's probably the the biggest lure i have that's a panther martin and we'll run that in the high lakes i won't run that in the creek here and then uh get back in your home um, I think it was a, a fly fishing shop in Bend, Oregon when I, I lived in Prineville for a little while and, uh, I picked it up there. What's nice about it, uh, it floats. So you drop it, you can find it. Well, unless it's a raging river. Um, I've got like three or four spools of, um, oh, two pound test. Basically this is a pill case full of little bit bigger lures. I got a couple of Rapplers in there, floaters. Um, those work real good. I've got some cast masters, things like that. And then I was getting crap from Matt Davis. Um, and actually a couple other people about fly fishing. So I, I kind of, I cheat. This is a torpedo bobber. Uh, I know how to fly fish, but fly fishing and something like this is just not fun. Um, and I take this and I tie my main line from my rod to here for my reel. And then I put four or five feet a liter off this end. And a lot of times what I'll do, especially if, um, you know, it's, it's warmer and there's a lot of mayflies or whatever flying around. Off the end of this, I'll put like a sinking fly, whether it be a bee predded prince or whatever. And above this, uh, a couple feet, I'll put like an eight inch drop fly uh, where that's legal to run to. And that'll be a dry fly. And what I'll do, especially in high lakes, I'll whip that thing out there and I'll dance that, that mayfly, that dry fly. And. And just pop it across the water. And a lot of times I'll reel in two at one time. But this is basically the redneck way to fly fish um, with this torpedo bobber. And it works really well. So that's pretty much all I bring for... Uh, I, I mean, minus sometimes I'm not really a power bait guy or a worm guy. But occasionally I will bring, um, you know, a little weight set and some small hooks. So this here... I've got two fuel canisters. I, I don't have two. I brought two. My girlfriend has one, and that's for the, uh, let me grab that. That is for the Primus Micron Lantern, and I, we've talked about this before, and she's got a canister for this. This is good for light. It heats up the tent, um, takes any kind of a mantle, basically. Super simple, self-igniting. You just click this down to ignite it, and the, what's that? Okay, yeah, we'll do it. Yeah, I've got a ton of photos with it from last night. And then I just keep it in a sunglass case for protection. This is one of my, I'm blind as a bat. I got Wiley X. I look like Harry Potter. They're horrible looking, but they're indestructible. Those I carry in a soft case, more or less. And then that fits in there perfectly, kind of protects it. Other fuel canister. Now this that's the uh, Evernew, however you want to pronounce it. This is the cook set that I use. Again, we've talked about a lot of this stuff before, but I've got two cook sets. I've got the one for my coffee, and then this one for my ramen or whatever. And then this is a, uh, I think it's a Soto Windmaster. And you can actually, this comes off. The burner and you can put an even smaller lighter weight one on there you can make it more compact doing it that way and then i got a lighter and i carry this that all fits in the small one um again the reason why i do the two system thing it's not the um the lightest but it's pretty close i think it's 11 and a half ounces for both cook sets and the stove is just so i can cook my coffee in one my ramen or dehydrated food in the other and i don't have my coffee tasting like ramen and vice versa. And it's a um, pretty slick system. That all fits on top there. This is a, a mega pullout from Kafaru. And I just have a ton of food, coffee, 
drink mix, all my foods just stuffed into there. And since this trip isn't really physically demanding, um, I brought a lot of food, a lot more than I probably should have. Now, I don't always bring this, but that's just a stand, and it uh, increases the stabilization of your cook system because they can get pretty top-heavy, especially with this little canister. So my stove gets screwed on that, and I don't have to worry about it falling over. What's that? This is an MSR. MSR, yep. Same as the fuel canister. It's kind of handy because it's got that spring-loaded deal in there to hold it in place. And then you can run bigger canisters as well. It's got the different uh, dimensionality there. I saw that this morning thinking, yeah, I've been there. Um, this is a very high-tech roll of toilet paper. The map. This is... Uh, my possibles pouch um this is more or less goes along with me everywhere anywhere i go i don't have it that dialed in i kind of j jammed a bunch of stuff in there but uh this is the se azula knife this has become in a very short period of time a very very awesome and favorite knife of mine i've used se before but recently we started using them again they've been great to work with actually but i take this knife here um and then i have the I'm going to keep calling it Tito, even though the guy that actually owns the company says it's Tito. I just feel weird saying Tito. I feel like I'm talking to a pimp. So I'm going to call it Tito. <laughs> uh, but I have the Tito knife and then the SE, and that's kind of my standard system now. It's worked great for, uh, you know, breaking down an animal camp stuff, whatever the case may be. Yeah, so and uh, without going into like this huge metallurgical deal there's different kinds of steel carbon steel i mean there's a ton of different types of um uh metal that knives are made of and the the bottom line is if you have a a knife that is extremely hard to sharpen um it's also probably holds its edge long well it does it holds its edge longer if the knife is easy to sharpen it it will um it will it'll dull quicker for me and one of the reasons i like this knife is I carry this tiny, uh, it's almost like a, it's a broadhead sharpener as well, but it's, it's, it literally is, is this about that long and about that wide. And you hold it on your finger like this, and I just run it down over and over and over, 15 swipes, 20 swipes, and I can shave with it again. Now, compare that to some different types of steel. Yes, it, it, it stayed sharp longer, but you're going to spend 20 minutes or a long time resharpening. So for me personally, I prefer to have a steel that I can resharpen quicker rather than, uh, you know, reinvent the wheel trying to resharpen or sharpen it again. Another thing, the smaller for me that I've not ha had great luck with a uh, harder steel sharpening it with the backpackable type sharpeners. I'm not just going to get it up there and fling it through a few times and have a great edge. It's going to take a while. I'm not a I don't want to have 7,000 guys chiming in or two cents on this. This is my own personal opinion and it's worked for me for years um, to just have a little bit softer steel to resharpen for what I do um, in the way, the way that I use the system. Um, but it is true, um, like with this one, it does dole a little bit quicker than other knives on the market, or other steels anyway. Uh, this here is my uh, my headlamp. I have multiple different types of headlamps. Uh, this is a black diamond. I, I honestly, I can't remember, I think it was called the Storm. But uh, what it's nice about it is it's if you touch the side, it shoots into a, a 250 lumen mode. So I have it on normal brightness, brightness and kind of a wide beam, and I just literally touch the side of this and it goes into 250 more of a straight beam uh i've had great luck with this last year um it's extremely waterproof just kind of works on a lever system it takes four triple a batteries um i also have um some petzels i have a bunch of headlamps over the years you know you think you lose when you buy one but right now this one's been pretty dang good um i also have some pretty heavy duty you know, rechargeable battery headlamps. And, uh, you know, those are great and all, but the big thing is once that battery's dead, it's dead. And I've kind of started to steer away from those now and just use lithium triple or uh, double A headlamps for the simple fact I can go to the gas station and pick up the batteries um, and not have to worry about it. This thing does last forever as well as far as battery life. I've got my backup spoon. In this here, I have a uh, tenacious tape 
extra mantle, super glue, suture kit, um, uh, blades for the, the Taito knife, a patch kit um, for the sleeping pad, some band-aids, disinfectant wipe, you know, things like that. So it's pretty, pretty cut and dry. This here is just a stirrup pin. Pretty simple. This is the classic three. I think they're on their third edition. Um, we've talked about this quite a bit. You just hit the button, stick the pin in the water, twist it around for 60 or 90 seconds, whatever it is. Once the light pops off, you're, you're good to go. We have some hikers walking by us. I also care. What's that? I know. These guys are motivated. Uh, these are MSR Aqua tabs. Um, when I get into camp, I usually fill a four liter, whatever, bladder or eight liter, 10 liter, whatever it is with camp water. And then I'll drop these pills or aqua mira in the camp water. So I don't have to sit there and stir forever. It takes 30 minutes and you're ready to go with these. This is just some fire starter stuff. I've got a lighter in there. Um, trioxane tablets. This is just a waterproof match case with long burn matches. I pretty much bring that exact system everywhere. One of the new things that's in here that I haven't screwed around with a whole lot, and it's heavy, uh, Uber Fire. And from what I understand, if you're going to die, that light that thing up and you won't die type of a deal. I've had the same luck with um, Trioxane. So I figured tonight, I'm going to screw around with this when we build a fire uh, tonight and just see how it works. Uh, there's some cotton in here. This is some kind of a treated... Um, I mean, that's got to be some kind of bark dust. I don't know what it is, but either way, we'll uh, screw around with that, see how it works. I've got backup batteries in here. This is actually uh, pre-workout inside of this. This is not uh, electrolytes. It was from Hammer Nutrition at one time, uh, but I kept this case and I put pre-workout in there. And that's kind of my my longest last mile need to get out way too much caffeine pour it in my mouth drink it type of a of a energy drink or a pre-workout what's that yes yes that's in there all the time and then i've just got some i think i got eight no four enduro packets in there um this one's peach uh, i actually this is 40 ounces of water and then a raspberry lemonade drink mix is heavenly for me so i usually do kind of a mixture with that so that's pretty much what's in there. There's a few things that'll be added, subtracted, more or less. This is my personal hygiene kit, which isn't much. Uh, I have Benadryl for allergies and mostly to make me sleep. Lip balm. I don't actually get chapped lips. That goes on my nose because I do get a raw nose. So don't ever borrow my chapstick because it's never seen my lips. It's only seen my snotty nose. This is not actually inside here all biotics. This is the biotics for Mountain Ops, uh, Phoenix, fish oil pills, zinc. Um, what else is in there? Emergent, uh, vitamin C, vitamin D, chewables, whatever the stuff is I take in the morning. That's, you know, mount the, the amount of days per trip I have is all inside this and uh, pour them in my hand and take them in the morning. I lost my good toothbrush for backpacking, so I snapped this off before I left. That's the modified toothbrush. Yep, and the uh, contact solution, migraine pills, extra contacts. That's about all I have in there right now. I forgot toothpaste, but thank God Amy did. Uh, so this is the a new fulcrum pack that we're coming out with. It hasn't been released. We'll do a video on that completely uh, separate later on. And then I have a guide lid. Now, as far as lids go, I actually have my girlfriend bring in the native lid. And the best way to explain... The guide lid works better as just a lid. The native works better if you're going to use it as a lid, but then use it also as a day pack. Um, I had her bring this, so honestly, I could run it as a fishing pack. I was able to, foot pit, able to fit both camera bodies in there, uh, puffy jacket, fishing tackle, beanie hat and gloves back here, things like that, and then just run up and down the creek. Uh, we did a bunch of fishing yesterday and today and caught a pile of fish that are no look bigger than six inches um so that's the native and that's on her woodsman over there and then i've got the guide lid and that's on the fulcrum here um camera stuff i've got two uh sony a7r2s with me this is a 35 millimeter lens it's a little bit heavy um but i i run this is a one four so 
I can go really, really shallow depth of field. And I keep carry this in this little neoprene Click Elite bag. On this camera, and this is just a standard neoprene deal. Uh, this is uh, 18 millimeter 2.8. That's what I do a lot of my scenery type shots inside the teepee, uh, stuff like that, night photos, landscape, whatever. This is an ape case, this yellow thing. And on this is an 85 millimeter 1.8 Batiste, Betis, I don't know how to pronounce it. This, this lens I don't use that much, but man, when I do, I love it. Uh, it's super good when I'm doing like, uh, product shots for Kafaru, things like that. Uh, as well as, uh, it's like a kind of a portrait lens, I guess you could say. This is a peak design camera strap. I think Brian would agree. One of the coolest thing invented quick releases. Um, super handy. I practice that pretty much everywhere I go. This is just a sea to summit dry sack. Uh, this has got a remote in it for, uh, firing the shutter, extra batteries, cleaning stuff, things like that for the cameras. This is a drum light bladder for camp water from MSR. The fossils plates. This is the bowl and the plate. Um, somehow, uh, Amy ended up with the green ones and I've got the girly blue ones. I don't know what happened there. I must have lost in rock, paper, scissors. And then uh, sleeping bags. This is the 20 degree. This is a regular wide. And I carry this in a five string medium uh, stuff sack from Kafaru. Uh, my girlfriend has the 20 degree uh, regular wide, uh, regular length width. Um, she likes a lot more wiggle room. And then that's in a dry sack. This is just a roll trop dry sack from Osprey. It's a 20 liter. Uh, you really don't have to run a dry sack with our bags. It doesn't hurt, but since it's synthetic, it's not that big of a deal. Um, this is just an extra set of darn tough socks. I actually have fit socks on my feet right now. Um, but I try to always bring at least one pair of socks, even for an overnighter. And then sleeping pads. This is the one my girlfriend's using. This is a Thermarest Neo Air X Lite. Uh, I think it's 11 and a half ounces. Uh, super, super lightweight. And we've been kind of bouncing back and forth, uh, just getting thoughts, you know, back and forth on what she likes, what I like. Brian, you're using this one, aren't you? Yeah, Neo Air. I think the Neo Air, that was the first version. And then this one came out after, and now they have two or three versions after that. This one here is the one I've been using all through last season and this season. And this is a X-Bed Sinmat Hyperlite. And uh, so far, so good. I mean, I, I have not had the use on this like I've had the, on the X-Lite. Um, the X-Lite I probably used for three or four years, whenever it came out with until last year. Last year, actually, I didn't I pop? I popped mine in the middle of the season, I think. I can't, yeah, I can't. Maybe it was... Maybe a shed season. Either way, it went the way of the dodo, and I got this. They were out of the X lights, and I wanted to try something new, so I got this X bed, and it's worked out pretty good. Now, the one thing I would say, and Brian and I talked about this yesterday uh, quite a bit, as far as dialing in gear, this is by no means dialed in. There's certain things we definitely can save weight on, and there's other things we probably need to add to. But this is close. I mean, it's not not a horrible gear list. Um, I think Brian's, you said you might upgrade your stove? Yes. Um, and cookware. And cookware. I've got pretty lightweight uh, cookware and stove where I can probably hone things down a bit. Uh, that possibles pouch, I probably should add some more first aid things to that. I have the ability from friends in the military that can get me some pretty high speed stuff as far as first aid goes. Um, so, I mean, that's one thing. Uh, you know, clothing wise, we're pretty tight on uh, clothing. But you can always, you know, torque things a little bit. The camera gear thing, you know, we pair a lot of camera gear, so we cut weight certainly where we can. Um, yeah, I was honestly thinking last night as I'm rolling off of my pad, maybe to start carrying a wider pad. Um, so I will see. Uh, the other thing, too, is um, you know, food is, is, is really, you know, our gear is not going to change that much, honestly. I mean, Brian, you may lose six ounces in cookware and uh, the cook set, right? Maybe. But in food, if you get dialed in on food, you can you lose on a 10 day hunt, you could lose a few pounds if you're, you know, compared to how you were packing before until now. I know I, I pack too much food. I think we could probably stay an extra day or two with what I brought. Um, 
but food is the big one. That's a big deal. Now, as far as the water system, again, I bring the a four liter bladder and I just pack a Nalgene in. And that's a lot different from what I used to do. I used to just pack in three or four liters all the time. And, uh, and sometimes if I know I need water or, or there's a chance that I'm not going to, uh, find any, I will pack in that water, but man, it's, it's, uh, what is it? A gallon's eight pounds. Um, so three liters, I guess is about eight pounds. And, uh, and that can be a problem, but, uh, yeah, I mean, we're pretty much screwed for the rest of our lives with weight because of camera gear. There's no way around it. Uh, I was going to say, I think that food and clothing Yeah, clothing is a is... place where guys make a big mistake. They bring way too much clothing. And I, I mean, for sure, I would agree with that. I just don't think right now you and I, I don't think you go much lighter than you. <laughs> I might die if I did. Um, I mean, really, a few twists and turns aside... What I just went over is about, you know, like I may bring the Fanatic jacket or the Fanatic hoodie instead of the core, that, that, the heavyweight core crew. Or I might bring the Kelvin Active instead of the Kelvin or the Kelvin, you know, a Kelvin down hoodie instead of the Kelvin Active. But that's all, I mean, pretty, pretty lightweight stuff. That Kelvin jacket's actually a little bit heavier than the Kelvin down hoodie or the Kelvin Active. Um, you know, gloves, do I need two sets? Yeah, probably not, but I'm a weenie, so I bring two. Um, not a, no, no. And, you know, a lot of that, and that's one of the things people need to decide too is, uh, if you're willing to take the pain of packing it in and it helps you that much, I say pack it. If, uh, you get back and you're in misery and you can't make it another mile, then you probably should take some stuff out of your backpack. And, uh, we'll go over that, you know, as the year goes on, as we get our stuff dialed in a little bit better and answer questions of other people's. But, uh, but yeah, that's about it. That's what we brought for, for this trip. Brian's got about the same stuff, except, uh, I think you got even more camera gear than I do. Rain gear. So I brought that jet stream. It's heavier than I probably need. There's, there's other systems. Uh, you can go lighter from, from Cisco specifically, obviously we're partnered up with them. Um, I don't wear rain pants a whole, whole lot. Um, Colorado, I don't need to now BC, North Idaho, Washington. Yeah. I'm packing rain pants. Um, but yeah, for, for me, the storm front is probably what I'll be carrying for, for every hunt. I don't mind that it's a little bit heavier for the extra durability and I, I get cold. Um, I just do. So it's nice as a wind blocker, a little bit thicker. Uh, I think you're using that, the thundercloud cloud. No, no, the, the, the one you used, the new one, the quiet one, that's the thundercloud or thunderhead. Yeah. I haven't used the thunderhead at all. Obviously I don't even know the name of it. Um, but yeah, the cloud burst is a little bit lighter weight and that's a good system as well. I haven't screwed with it as much. It's loud. Yeah. The thunderhead is quiet. Uh, I don't, uh, for Colorado, I wouldn't use the Thunderhead. Yeah. I'd rather have the Thunderhead for days where it rains all day long, drizzles just a little bit, because then I'll actually be stocking critters in, in my rain gear. Yeah, I, I, I got to be honest. I don't hunt in Colorado in the rain that much. When I say that, meaning heavy rain. If it's raining that hard, I'm either in my shelter or under a tree hiding out. Um, you know, I, and it, 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 I... The sun comes out, right? I mean, if I get my clothes soaking wet, in Colorado anyway, very rarely is there not going to be a four to six hour stretch of super warm weather, uh, good sunlight to dry my stuff off. It's a little bit different. We have to deal with altitude here. We don't deal with the rain as much. Um, you know, you may deal with snow up high, uh, heavy winds, things like that. But And that system will change depending upon where we're at in the world and, and uh, you know, time of year specifically. Yeah, um, I kind of skipped over that. We brought the, uh, when I say we, Amy and I brought in the Sawtooth from Kafaru. And uh, and Brian brought in a Hilleberg uh, Onion GT2. And we have, uh, and you'll see in the photos on my Instagram, Facebook page, but uh, I brought Tyvek. We both to bring two sheets of Tyvek in. I did bring the stove. We didn't have to put it together. It didn't get that get cold last night. But a lot of people get super, super paranoid about the rain coming in underneath. And it rained for... Man, I would say six hours, eight hours straight last night, and uh, yeah, no no rain came in. I mean, I, I've never had rain come in more than maybe an inch or two on the edges, but I don't I don't put my I have common sense when I set up my shelter. You don't want to put it in a hole. Um, you know, if you can get it on kind of kind of a bench. In this case, obviously, a little bit of downhill slope, um, and not an issue. Now, 
you know, there's t- certain times we talk about this all the time, whether we're going to run a Hilleberg or we're going to run a Kafaru. Now, I brought this, um, the number one reason, the stove. I thought it was going to get really cold. It's supposed to snow. It still might. Um, and, you know, that's hu- a lot of room for Amy and I to hang out in there. The other thing, too, is uh, you can stand up in the sawtooth, which is handy. So there's pros and cons to everything. But certainly... I've got a liner in this one because of condensation. You know, the liner helps. But we certainly never have issues with water running underneath. Now, how how'd you like the Hilleberg last night? Well, I'll get in here where the microphone can pick me up. I thought that the Hilleberg was, uh, dude, it pops up like in seconds. Yeah. So that was really nice because, um, you know, if you're backpacking, it's lightweight and it pops up super fast. We got hammered with rain last night. We're bone dry. The vestibule in that, uh, on, what is it? Onion GT2. Onion GT2 uh, is gigantic. I mean, so much gear could fit in there. And that's floorless right there. Yeah, the vestibule. And, <clears throat> yeah, the vestibule. And so when the water's coming down, it's raining and stuff, you know, there's that concern of there's could be water to go underneath your tent there and get your gear wet. After sleeping as much as I have in a floorless shelter, it's no longer a concern for me. Before I did, I always kind of had this, you know, thing in my head about it being floorless, about getting wet and water going underneath. It's just, it doesn't happen. It's like the water comes to the sides, especially if you set up in the right spot. And that with a little practice, you'll figure that out. It's not that hard. And um, so last night <clears throat> I had to take a leak around 2.30 a.m. <laughs> and I was missing the floorless shelter yeah. because <laughs> I just unzip the top zip on my Kafaru sleeping bag. I roll over and as gross as this is to some of you people, I just pee on the ground right there <clears throat> on the edge of the tent there. And on it, that note, it is amazing how far, I mean, it's like, uh, you know, Democrat or Republican <laughs> peeing on the floor, not peeing on the floor. Like some guys just, I mean, literally, hang me up in the courtyard and throw rocks out. You pee on your floor? Stone you to death. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I'm like, I, sometimes, yeah, I, I, do. I do. It did. It doesn't bother me one iota. Um, it's convenient. And I pretty much have to pee at least once most nights. I, I got a I gotta, full admittance here on Phil's sheep hunt. And Phil can chime in on this. It rained so hard for three days. It got to a point that... And I was in a bivy, right? Like a Gore-Tex coffin with a sheep tarp, right? That sheep tarp, there's not a lot of square footage. And it got to the point where we were recovering, right? But it was raining so hard that I didn't want to get out of the shelter and get wet. And uh, I peed in my Fossil's bowl and just chucked it out. (laughs) And I'm like, that's disgusting. How lazy am I? (laughs) It was that, that much desperation to not get out of that tent. And I'm like, well, I'll just wash it. It's not that big of a deal. But... I've told a couple people that in private, and the first guy's like, Lander. Yeah. Lander's like, I do that. He's oh, like, yeah. yeah. And then the other guy was like looking at me like I just slept with the sheep. I'm like, Dude, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, for years when I when I was in a floored shelter, I had a pee bottle. Yeah. Just because I don't want to get up and get out and get cold and put my boots on and climb out. And That's the thing last night with the Hilleberg is that's just part of the, the, the deal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but man, I can't say enough about how comfortable it is and how roomy it is, how much space there is, how easy it is to set up, how secure it is. You know, you're not worrying about it. But two things I miss floorless, like I can just walk in, get my boots on the ground. I don't have to worry about, um, you know, get, keeping sticks and yeah. dirt and stuff out of the. I love that. And the floorless shelter is just lightweight for how big it is. I mean, you and Amy are standing up inside your shelter. Uh, yeah. Caitlin and I are hunkered down and kind of in a smaller space. And so, especially uh, if it's raining a ton, man, and you're in your shelter for a long time, it's nice to have something with so much space. Yeah, and it's it's funny because, I, I mean, I do the design and marketing for Kafaro, and I still use Hilleberg's from time to time. And I've always been up front about I mean, everybody knows that, even Kafaro, but... Um, it's not like I have a special sauce to answer people's questions with, if that makes it, you know, what's the one shelter? Should I get this or this? I can sell you on a sawtooth and a stove or a super tarp and a stove all day long, but that 
could I could easily sell you on a Hilleberg as well is what I'm getting at. Like there's so many pros and cons to each. There's no right answer. And I, I will say if if you are camping where you need wood heat and you aren't above tree line very often, it's hard for me not to sell a guy a a shelter, uh, a floorless shelter with a stove. If you're a guy that camps above tree line, sheep hunts, Arizona where there's scorpions and spiders or whatever, yeah, you're 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 getting a floor on your shelter more than most likely. There's no way around it. So I would agree. Yeah. So yeah. Anyway, that's what we got. We'll catch up with you. We're gonna hike a couple more miles in, see if we find any better fishing and uh, more moose sheds. Stay gritty. The future of public lands. All of us own them, all of us use them. Political activists are demanding us to hand over the public lands where the state legislators could transfer and control these lands. U.S. citizens own 640 million acres of public lands, which creates 6.1 million jobs and generates $646 billion per year. States have been selling off land to pay bills for over 100 years, thus closing access to the public. 39% of original 64 million acres have been sold. The cost of land management would break most state budgets. For instance, who will pay the hundreds of millions of dollars to fight major wildfires each year? It doesn't matter how many promises are made. The financial reality is it will force states to have to sell off our public land. President Theodore Roosevelt said, we must preserve our lands for future generations, not merely to the people now alive, but to the unborn people. Our duty to the whole bids us restrain an unprincipled present-day minority from wasting the heritage of these unborn generations.